So just to start off, um, I just want to go over what a public information meeting is. Um, so it's informal in nature, unlike a public hearing, we're not taking any formal minutes, um, but this meeting is recorded and will be posted online for reference just for anyone who wasn't able to make it tonight. Um, any comments that you have that you want to have formally considered by the regional district board for review at first and second reading of the uh, amendment bylaws should be submitted in writing. Um, so that can be done by email. You can fill out a feedback form and bring that to our office or send it in by mail, whichever you prefer. Um, I'm here to answer any questions uh, that you may have after listening to my presentation. And if I'm not able to get to all the questions today, or you come up with another question later, um, you're welcome to follow up with me. Um, I have my contact information just at the end of the presentation. In terms of how to use WebEx, and I'll go over this right at the end as well, um, but once I open the uh, meeting up for kind of a question and answer session, we'll be taking questions in turn. So to indicate that you wanna speak, um, if you're participating by computer, you'll click the participants button, which is located at the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, you'll hover your mouse over your name and just click the raise hand button. If you're participating by phone, you'll have to click star three to raise your hand. Um, and you'll be unmuted when it's your turn to speak and I'll let you know in advance. Um, but once you're done, just be sure to click the raise hand button or press star three again to take your hand down just so we're able to keep track of uh, who has outstanding questions and who doesn't. All right, so that being said, I'll go ahead and get into the background a bit. Um, some of this might be old information just because, um, you know, as, as Falder residents, you are quite well aware of the situation out there. Um, but the Falder zoning review was initiated in 2021 uh, following resident concerns that uh, surrounding water availability. And this was particularly in regards to comments that we heard through public consultation uh, regarding a rezoning application back in 2021 uh, to facilitate a subdivision within Falder, although it was south of the boundaries of the Falder water system. And I've just highlighted for those of you on the computer, um, the property there in yellow and the water system in blue for a uh, reference there. The Meadow Valley Aquifer has had a history of water supply concerns and the, uh, the Falder water system itself is currently seen to be at capacity. So um, this has kind of driven quite a bit of concern uh, with respect to water resourcing in the area. Uh, multiple studies have been undertaken since the 1990s to assess the Falder water system um, and additional infrastructure has subsequently been constructed and that includes a new well and a uranium uh, treatment system as well. So compounding on to the concerns um, of water resourcing is the number of development applications uh, that we've received since 2014. Um, and these typically seek to increase density within the Falder and Meadow Valley area. And I've just highlighted those uh, applications that we've received here. So one of the primary constraints that we see to subdivision is having a large enough par uh, property so that if you split that property up, the resultant parcels that are created by the subdivision are still able to meet that minimum parcel size that's required by the applicable zoning. Um, so uh, the development applications that I referred to, um, those include rezoning applications, which seek to reduce a property's minimum parcel size to allow for subdivision to occur, um, and subdivision applications where a parcel is already large enough to be subdivided without a rezoning. So like most of our other electoral areas in the RDOS, uh, Electoral Area F has an official community plan bylaw or an OCP bylaw. Um, so these types of bylaws, uh, official community plans, uh, they designate land for specific purposes um, in order to set a direction for how land is meant to be used into the future. So you can think of them as like a blueprint or a map for the community's future as they do identify a long-term vision, supporting goals and objectives, as well as policies that, are, uh, that set out how to achieve those. So in this regard, you can kind of think of o OCP policies as, uh, as being used as decision-making guidelines for the board when they're asked by a, a rezoning applications to consider allowing ad hoc changes to land uses uh, within certain zones and also within specified areas. So a review of the Electoral Area F official community plan bylaw was undertaken between 2016 and 2018 and attempted to capture the concerns uh, that we heard from residents um, regarding water resourcing in the area and um, capturing these within the inclusion or through the inclusion of background statements, as well as policies that speak to water supply and quality concern, uh, water quality concerns in a folder. So this bylaw also contains local area policies specific to the Falder Meadow Valley area. 
And that kind of just recognizes the fact that the Falder Meadow Valley area has certain characteristics that are unique to that area and are uh, not otherwise addressed through the more general policies, which apply to very specific land use designations. And despite the fact that the OCP bylaw was reviewed during this time, there was no follow-up action to review the zoning bylaw and ensure that zoning regulations within Falder reflected those same concerns regarding water resources. So for clarity, uh, zoning regulations set out what you can and can't do on lands within certain zones. And if you do something, the zoning regulations outline how those must be done. And that's kind of done through, for example, the use of minimum setbacks, height caps, et cetera. So when I say that there was no follow-up review that was done to the zoning bylaw to ensure that they actually reflect those uh, water concerns, this means that no permitted uses, which could be detrimental to the overall water resourcing, were actually restricted or pulled back. And that kind of brings us to where we are now. So the main issues that were considered as part of the Falder zone review were, first of all, uh, whether the current OCP policies actually reflect or uh, accurately reflect community concerns uh, regarding future development in the Falder Meadow Valley area and water availability. Um, currently, we do have policy within the OCP bylaw that speaks to discouraging subdivision, but it only speaks to it in the sense that we want to maintain the rural character of the area. And that's quite a vague term rural character, and it doesn't really address the fact that subdivision could negatively impact um, the water concerns in the area. So there's no direct correlation between uh, water availability and, and that being connected with uh, subdivision. And the second issue that we looked at as well was whether the zoning bylaw should actually be permitting uh, uses that increase density within the water service area in consideration of the known water resource issues out there. So just a bit of background then on the board consideration. Um, the regional district board has seen this project on multiple occasion over the last two years. Um, at the December 2nd, 2021 planning and development committee meeting, the committee had considered the proposed OCP and zoning amendments and had made a resolution to defer consideration of those bylaws um, until the Meadow Valley aquifer study was completed. Now, as some of you may know, in August, 2022, uh, that study was completed and then presented to the board um, at the Environment and Infrastructure Committee meeting. So I'm just going to do a really quick background, just enough to give uh, kind of an idea of what led us to the proposed amendments today. Um, but the aquifer study was completed uh, by Associated Environmental and built on previous studies that have been undertaken uh, regarding water availability in the Falder area. And in general, the objective of the study was to better assess the current and future groundwater availability um, and the capacity of the aquifer to support the different land uses that we see in the Falder Meadow Valley area. This study included the development of a hydrogeological conceptual model for the aquifer and also identified four distinct subregions of the aquifer. So, um, one of the primary conclusions of the study was that the Meadow Valley Aquifer is variable in regards to its vulnerability and its supply limitations, depending on where you are within the aquifer. Um, and as I mentioned, the study actually divided the aquifer up into four different subregions, being the North Meadow Valley, South Meadow Valley, North Falder, and Trout Creek Valley um, subregions. And while there were a number of different recommendations that came from the study, uh, the key recommendation from the planning kind of side of things that we're seeking to address with the Falder Zone Review is the recommendation to limit or prevent additional development, land uses, or activities that draw water out of the Meadow Valley Aquifer uh, within the Meadow Valley or North Falder areas. And the tools that we have available to us um, from a land use perspective um, are the adoption and application of OCP policies and zoning provisions that speak to limiting density and water intensive land uses. So that being said, um, at the planning and development committee meeting of September 2020, uh, 22, 2022, uh, the committee had directed staff to update the amendment bylaws by incorporating the recommendations contained in the Meadow Valley Aquifer study regarding use and density. And then following this motion that was made, um, on a staff level, we worked towards updating the amendment bylaws and we brought this back to the most recent planning and development committee meeting just last month. So at their meeting of April 20th, 2023, um, the planning and development committee uh, had reviewed the updated amendment bylaws and resolved that the new policies be introduced to the area F, OCP and zoning bylaws that speak to the protection, maintenance and management of water resources within the broader 
uh, Falder area uh, designated community watersheds. And I'll get more into the community watersheds in a bit. So um, with all this being said, uh, the project is moving forward once again, and this requires us to kind of redo some of the steps that we had undertaken previously. Uh, specifically in 2021, uh, we had previously sent out referrals to any agencies that we believe would be impacted by these potential changes. Um, we had pu previously undertaken public engagement as well. Uh, some of you may remember a public information meeting that occurred back in October 2021. Um, and also the APC had previously considered the amendments as well. And given the time that's passed and the changes that have been made, we're doing these, these steps again just to make sure that we're getting um, up-to-date feedback from any impacted agencies. The APC can give us a recommendation on the updated um, amendment bylaws, which they did consider it on Monday and had uh, recommended approval of those bylaws. Um, and then today we're, we're coming back to the community to seek feedback on the proposed bylaw amendments as well. And then once we've completed all this, we'll be bringing the proposed amendments back to the board for first and second reading. And we've identified a tentative date of June 1st. And if the board gives first and second reading to the amendment bylaws, we will be scheduling a public hearing. So moving on to the actual amendment uh, amendments themselves, uh, the proposed amendments can be summarized in four major points, and they seek to target water resource concerns at various levels and scales. So the first of which being um, the proposed uh, zoning amendments, uh, they include targeted rezoning of properties within the boundaries of the Falder Community Water System Service Area. And then at a slightly broader scale, uh, the proposed OCP bylaw amendments include the revision and addition of local area policies which apply to the Falder Meadow Valley area. Uh, and this is this area is mostly reliant on the Meadow Valley Aquifer for water resources, so that kind of captures uh, the aquifer level. At its broadest scale, uh, the proposed OCP amendments also include the revision and addition of resource area policies that relate to the protection, maintenance, and management of the four designated community watersheds in electoral area F. And then further to the proposed watershed level OCP amendments is the proposed rezoning of Crown land specifically uh, within the boundaries of those four designated community watersheds. So diving in a bit deeper then, uh, the first of the proposed amendments involves the introduction of a new small holdings Falder zone. So that would be the SH6 zone. Uh, this new zoning would apply to properties only within the Falder water system and would restrict the permitted density of these parcels to one principal dwelling unit, so a single detached dwelling typically, and would remove secondary suites, accessory dwellings, and agriculture as permitted uses. Um, and just for clarity, uh, most parcels in the Falder water system actually cannot currently have an accessory dwelling, and that's roughly 70% of the parcels, and that's simply due to being under the one hectare minimum parcel size that's required to have an accessory dwelling on properties that are not connected to a community water system. Additionally, the zoning would increase the minimum parcel size for subdivision to five hectares, which would effectively prevent the subdivision of par uh, properties within the Falder water system service area without an approved rezoning. And then without considering any legal topographical or lot layout constraints, there's currently 13 parcels within the water system that could be subdivided without a rezoning to reduce minimum parcel size. And moving on to the proposed OCP amendments, um, as I mentioned, various amendments are being proposed to the Electoral Area F OCP bylaw to address the concern of whether existing policies are adequately reflecting community concerns regarding future development in the Falder and Meadow Valley areas, as well as water availability. The proposed amendments comprise of both policy uh, replacement and the addition of new policies and would discourage subdivision of parcels within the Falder water system service area the construction of accessory dwellings and secondary suites within the water system service area, as well as the expansion of that water system. And these are seen, uh, these amendments are seen to introduce stronger language as it relates to subdivision and densification uh, within the Falder Community Water System Service Area and would provide clearer policy direction for the board in cases where an application were to come in seeking subdivision, densification, or inclusion into the water system. 
So in addition to the water system level uh, local area policies, new policies are also being proposed in relation to the broader trout community watershed, uh, which encompasses the Falder Meadow Valley area, um, as shown here on this diagram. Um, and subsequently, that also captures the Meadow Valley aquifer boundaries and the Falder water system. Currently, the Falder Meadow Valley local area policies speak to the board discouraging subdivision of properties in order to maintain the real character of the area. And as I mentioned, we do see this to be vague and imprecise, and it doesn't actually correlate water resource issues with subdivision. So to address this, we're proposing that a new policy be introduced, which would state that the board does not support the rezoning of parcels in order to facilitate subdivision, particularly within the trout community watershed. Um, in order to maintain the existing parcel sizes and preserve existing water resources. So this is a local area policy that would apply to uh, the entire community watershed area, uh, the trout community watershed area. So it's quite an expansive uh, policy. Um, and I keep throwing around this term designated community watershed, um, but to be clear, community watersheds are designated by the province under the Forest and Range Practices Act, and that they do this to uh, protect water that's used for drinking. Um, there's four designated community watersheds in electoral area F, that being Farley, Peachland, Shingle, and Trout. Um, and as you can tell, the Trout Community Watershed is the most expansive of those four and extends across a majority of electoral area F. And actually, that community watershed also extends between electoral area F and electoral area H being rural Princeton. So, with the mention of electoral area H, um, their OCP bylaw already contains statements and policies regarding the protection, maintenance, and management of the trout community watershed under their resource area designation, as well as their local area policies for the Princeton Summerland Corridor, uh, which includes the Aris, Hayes Creek, uh, Chain, and Osprey Lakes area, as well as Headwater Lakes. Um, the electoral area H zoning bylaw also contains a uh, watershed resource area already, uh, which applies solely to crown lands and heavily permits limited use, uh, heavily permits uh, or heavily limits uh, permitted uses. And the electoral area F OCP bylaw actually does contain policy uh, similar to the uh, electoral area H OCP bylaw that supports the identification and establishment of a watershed resource area zone for crown lands within the designated community watersheds. So some of the amendments that we're proposing would actually implement this policy that's been um, in the OCP bylaw since 2018. Um, and these proposed amendments would be revising existing policies under the resource area designation to incorporate um, aspects of the existing watershed re related policies. So the proposed amendments to the electoral area F OCP bylaw and the Okanagan Valley uh, zoning bylaw, um, this includes uh, proposed additions uh, to the resource area OCP policies regarding the protection, maintenance, and management of the water resources in the watersheds, as uh, mentioned. And they would apply to lands within those de designated community watersheds. Um, the proposed amendments also include the rezoning of crown lands within the watersheds. Uh, to watershed resource area, so WRA zone, um, and this would limit uses that could negatively impact associated water bodies. So this would implement um, for crown parcel specifically a 120 hectare minimum parcel size. Um, and we don't typically uh, think of crown parcels as being candidates for a subdivision, um, but we are imposing this large of a minimum parcel size as a means of keeping these parcels large and unfragmented. And to be clear, um, privately held parcels would retain their existing zoning, uh, aside from those within the Falder water system, which would be rezoned to small holdings Falder. So just as a bit of a summary um, assessment of these proposals, uh, the proposed amendments address the Meadow Valley Aquifer study, as well as development concerns at a uh, water system, as well as a watershed level. Um, the proposed amendments would implement existing policy that already exists within the electoral area F OCP bylaw uh, regarding just safeguarding and protecting the health of our community watersheds. And we do see that a watershed level management approach um, as being appropriate, just considering the fact that uh, water bodies within watersheds are seen to be incredibly interconnected and wide reaching. So 
we do believe that this is an appropriate way to address the uh, recommendation that came out of the Meadow Valley Aquifer study. And now, right before I open it up for a question and answer session, I'll just once again go over the WebEx instructions for anyone who missed it at the beginning here. But as I mentioned, we will take questions in turn. Uh, so in, to, in order to indicate that you want to speak, it just depends on whether you're on the computer or on your phone. You'll have to click the raise hand button if you're on the computer or click star three to raise your hand if you're on the phone. And I'll let you know when it's your turn to speak and unmute you at that point. But once you're done, just make sure that you click the raise hand button to put your hand down or press star three to take your hand down if you're on the phone. And with that being said, um, I'll just leave this up just shortly. Um, for anyone who has any questions after this or um, your questions aren't able to be answered tonight, or you'd like to submit written comments, please just contact me um, by email or by phone. Um, I'll also drop this information in the chat as well uh, for anyone who doesn't catch it, but otherwise you can find it on the application web page. And with that being said, I will go ahead and open it up. Thanks everyone for your patience. <laughs> All right, and I see we've got a hand from Director Coyne. Go ahead. Uh, the question, okay, the question yes. I have, um, I don't know why camera isn't working, but um, I have actually, I was unaware that we had the uh, actual watershed thing for Area H. I, I knew there was special protection for um, headwaters, but I didn't realize it went any further past that. So will this encompass like the Trout Creek Ranch is, is my kind of my first question? Yes, so I know that the Trout Creek Ranch straddles both H and F, um, so the same types of uh, policies and zoning would actually apply on the other side now if this were to get adopted. Now, they would have water licenses through the province on on their wells and and I know they irrigate out of the creek and stuff there. Would that be affected by any of this changed um, bylaw? I don't believe so. Um, so in terms of like the actual zoning itself, it would still allow for agriculture as a permitted use. So it's not like it, we would be taking away their ability to continue ranching. Um, I mean, the province, I think, is, you know, within their own kind of ability to review licenses. Um, I'm not sure how often that they tend to do that or how long they tend to issue these licenses for for water usage uh, for agricultural purposes. Um, but I don't foresee it uh, necessarily being um, any more restrictive than it would have been in Area H. Yeah, because with your water license, it all goes back to fitter, first in time, first in line. So um, all of this would be hinged upon, would, I guess my question is, would all of this be hinged upon the water licenses that the existing uh, landowners have? Like, do we actually have the ability to do this? We we can limit the zoning. I just I just really concerned about. I don't want to see the regional district get into water management because we have a very convoluted uh, government system that's trying to get a handle on that. And that took years and years and years to to work that out. And I'm really worried about that getting mixed up with with our stuff. Right. And I mean, water licensing is still, that's still with the Ministry of Forest. So we don't really have a say in that. So if the Ministry of Forest decides there's enough water to allocate for, you know, a ranching operation, then they're, they're, that's their jurisdiction to do so. Um, and yeah, with agriculture particularly, that's something that is reviewed by the Ministry of Forest. It's more so domestic uses that we have no control over um, with the Ministry of Forest and us as well. So I'm not sure if that really answered your question there. Uh, but it's kind of out of our jurisdiction to, in terms of those licenses. 
Yeah, that, that, that was my thing is like, can we actually do this and be within provincial guidelines is it's, it's, I don't know. The other, the other question was, um, where you had the, um, the zoning down to 5 acres or a ma minimum 5 acre parcels. Uh, so, 5 hectare or 5 hectares. So. Is that going to affect the right to farm legislation or is the right to farm legislation trumps all of our stuff? So, um, is there in this could somebody turn around and drill their own well and farm on that on that property, which would be you know drawing water from that aquifer? These are all the crazy um, I, questions that have been going through my head since I read this <laughs> stuff. And it's Riley and I talked about this yesterday, and it's it's really I'm scared we're opening a bag of worms, is what I'm doing. No, and they're fair questions for sure. And this is absolutely the perfect time to be asking these questions. Um, I believe I chatted with Chris about this um previously, um, in terms of the right to farm act, because there's no property in the Falder water system that's actually, I believe, in the ALR. Um, so that's one component of the right to farm act. And then there's also the other side of it where you have, um, I believe it's like farm status as well. Um, but in this case, I don't, I don't believe that the right to farm act would end up kind of trumping the situation here. Like us as a local government would have the ability to pull back agriculture as a permitted use on non ALR lands. Um, and then if any wells were, uh, if someone wanted to drill a well for agricultural purposes, they would have to go to the Ministry of Forests in order to apply for that uh, license, or at least register that well. Yep. So it's it's definitely something I can look a bit more into and get um, you know just a second confirmation on. I'm just gonna write that down. Yeah, these were just all the bells and whistles that were going off in my my little brain. <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, and I believe uh, Henry Stubbs was next, so you go ahead, you're unmuted. Hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Uh, Henry Stubbs here. I'm a little confused. We lump in Folder and Meadow Valley as sort of one unit, and yet According to the water survey that was done last year, there's a vast difference between the Meadow Valley area and the Falder area in terms of water availability. So, and and also to park, you know, from a topographic out, outlook, there's also a huge difference. I mean, Meadow Valley is for the most part flat, and there are existing farms, etc. There. And I can see some rationale for you know, having a fairly large parcel size. But for the Falder end, it appears from, if I read it correctly, um, from the water survey that there's near unlimited water at this end. And I'm just not sure why we're kind of all being lumped in together when they're quite different. So, just to be clear, um, with the Falder community water system, that is actually one of the aquifer, or sorry, one of the sub regions. It's within one of the sub regions that was identified in the study as being one of the ones that we should be limiting in terms of use and density. So, just to keep that clear, and it's certainly not to say that the water availability is unlimited within the aquifer. Um, while it does vary across the aquifer uh, sub regions, um, the the Meadow Valley Aquifer is known to have water concerns in terms of availability. So, um, just to kind of clarify that information there, um, but um, in terms of kind of the lumping together of that, it's part of it. It does have to deal with just similar characteristics, right? So, the water concerns are something that does link both the Falder and the Meadow Valley areas, and that is something that was captured when we did do the review of the electoral area F OCP bylaw. Um, you know just a few years ago there. So, I mean, I can look into the history more, 
um, in terms of what originally led to both of those communities kind of being lumped in um, to the local area policy sections. But um, I'm not sure if I can address any other outstanding questions at this point, um, or if you've had any other questions that have come up since I've been speaking. No, I'm, I'm just, they, they seem like completely different areas in my mind. And maybe I didn't read that report correctly, but it seemed to me that um, North Meadow Valley and Meadow Valley were, uh, there was some really major water concerns, but the areas closest to Trout Creek, there was vast amounts of water. Um, not that, you know, if we had a couple or three drought years in a row, possibly there could be a problem, but it's more conducive to smaller parcels at this end of the valley than at the other end of the valley. And I might remind you that the provincial government is fully on board with uh, building as many new homes as possible, because, as you know, we're in a housing crisis. And it seems that <clears throat> if we restrict, I mean, nobody's suggesting we put in townhouses or condominiums. We're talking simply single family dwellings. And it, with that kind of thinking, it seems to me that um, this is as reasonable an area to keep it or to allow two hectare properties instead of five. Five is pretty, pretty large properties. And there's actually not that many down on, you know, the, uh, Fish Lake Road down at the bottom up to the first cattle guard. There's none of those properties are five hectares. Well, there might be one. But uh, so, I mean, if we're trying to limit the parcel size, I think that ship has already sailed back in the 80s when this when it, when it was developed down below. And that's all I got. Thank you for your comments. And um, if there's anything that I, like I said, I hadn't touched on, just feel free to uh, follow up with me in writing. Um, I believe we've, ex we've exchanged emails um, in the past, so you have my contact information, so thank you. And the next hand I saw was from Sandy Berry. Um, and go ahead, Sandy. Oops. Hey, there. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I, I guess uh, I'm joining this meeting to perhaps uh, provide a little bit of historical context to the water situation in the Meadow Valley Falder area. I, I've read uh, the study and I agree uh, pretty much totally with what the study uh, indicates as far as how the dynamics of how the aquifer uh, works. And, and, and I think the previous gentleman that was talking um, talks about uh, uh, different being different areas. Meadow Valley aquifer is a generalized term for all of the water from Meadow Valley right down to the district of Summerland, right? And and to, from a simple point of view, it's um, the water spills out of Meadow Valley uh, and comes down towards us. Uh, and, and there's a series of small lakes or pools that uh, that uh, the majority of the water is is drawn from. That's that's how it works, and and the study confirms that, in in my mind. And uh, uh, um, I I I just uh, based on the historical perspective of how development in this area has happened in the past, uh, uh, it's been proved uh, conclusively in my mind that the aquifer pools between Meadow Valley and, and uh, the, the District of Summerland boundaries are not adequate to support a, a high level of, of development in, in this area. Um, the, the, the obviously the surface water and, and aquifers are, are two different issues and, and, um, and, and I guess they're both regulated by the provincial government, but uh, uh, the, 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 the thing to remind, uh, remember as well is, and this has been proved by a study back in the, the 1990s, the Meadow Valley aquifer per se, that's underneath the big flat area in, in Meadow Valley, not only spills towards us down the valley, but it also spills into Garnet Valley down too. There's the water goes in both directions there. So 
um, it, it, there just isn't a huge uh, supply of water. Uh, and, 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 and historically, there's never been a, a, a real good quantitative assessment of, of how much water there is and, and how, and the dynamics of how the aquifer recharges, uh, di uh, discharges and recharges. And, and that's, in my mind, is critical to developing, uh, developing development policies for the area. Um, I, I generally support, uh, uh, these bylaw amendments at this time because they uh, they are they are centered around uh, ensuring that there is sustainable water uh, supplies for our community and when I speak of our community I'm talking about where I live south of the water service area right up into Meadow Valley and and I think that it's going to be monitored uh, a little more critically in the future so that future development can can uh, can take that in, into um, in, um, into account, but you know there is just no data, reliable data on how this aquifer actually performs over a long period of time. Um, uh, and and the other thing that I read in the report, Shannon, too, or in in the uh, in, in the uh, uh, amendment or the proposed bylaws, is they're talking about protecting. The aquifer by decommissioning existing wells, especially in the Falder water service area, and I strongly support that because they are all uh, entry points to the aquifer in general, especially um, I guess east of east of Meadow Valley that that could uh, uh, um, impact the community Falder water community system and, and those of us that live further east that are in in that aquifer pool as well. So. Those are my comments. Hopefully, that sheds some re reasonable light on things from a historical perspective. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate the comments and uh, you know you sharing your experience and your knowledge of the area as well. So thank you. Okay. And next up, I've got uh, John. John, go ahead. So thanks, Shannon. Um, I'm just. Pulling up, you guys used to on your strategic planning portal for the Falder zoning review have a PowerPoint presentation that was given by Associated Environmental. Um, and one of the recommendations to planning was to limit domestic groundwater use within the Meadow Valley or North Falder aquifer subregions. Now, you pointed that out at the beginning of your presentation. But one of the other recommendations that was laid out in that PowerPoint presentation is no need to limit domestic use in Trout Creek Aquifer subregion. And that's exactly where the Falder community well is located. So I'm just wondering, um, I guess I'm just wondering your thoughts on that uh, because these are the these are the engineers that you guys hired to assess this situation. One of their recommendations was no need to limit domestic use in Trail Creek Aquifer subregion. And, and then another one of their recommendations was to look into requirements for a new groundwater license application with the Ministry of Forests in order to allow what very limited infill and further development there could be in this area. Um, how come? We haven't heard anything about um, improving our water license with the Ministry of Forests. How come that hasn't been an option that we've discussed? I think the water license um, application has been discussed previously. I can't really speak too much to it as it is kind of out of my department, unfortunately. That's kind of more on the utility side of things that would have been dealing with uh, the Ministry of Forests. I can uh, you know, certainly follow up in that regard. Um, but kind of with respect to the rest of your question um, regarding kind of the involvement of the Trout Creek Valley sub um, region of the aquifer as well. So, I mean, I think one of the really tricky things is that, um, and I have mentioned this in previous reports uh, that we've brought forward to the Planning and Development Committee, but um, it's with the Meadow Valley aquifer boundaries. And, you know, as you saw in the uh, presentation itself, it's quite a wonky boundary that crosses through parcels, not necessarily wholly, but partially. So you're capturing parts of parcels, 
um, with this, it's a polygon over um, over those parcel uh, boundaries there. Um, and that creates a really difficult kind of administrative situation to manage land uses within, you know, parts of a property like that. Um, so with that in mind, and also, in, like, as I mentioned, uh, with just like the interconnectedness of water bodies that we have within the watershed and, you know, um, not being able to fully and like distinctly confirm, um, you know, any downstream impacts of uh, water uses um, in the area, it seems to make more sense than to apply a broader level policy or broad level policies to the overall watershed um, while, you know, focusing the zoning regulations uh, strictly within the community water system um, to limit uh, any detrimental water uses. So um, I'm not sure if that fully uh, answers your questions there, um, but, you know, certainly you're welcome to follow up. Yeah, so I guess one of one of the things that we've been told recently about our watershed is that it's the second largest that in the Okanagan Basin. Is that can can you confer, can somebody can, can confirm that? Um, I'm not the, certain. The trout the trout creek watershed with its you know eleven bodies of water that are maintained by the district of Summerland is the second largest in the Okanagan Basin. So if we know we have the second largest concentration of water in the Okanagan and the people downstream of us in Summerland, though they have water restrictions, have ancient, archaic irrigation systems that just spew water all over old fruit trees with no regard for any sort of conservation or anything like that. How could it possibly be that we would deny a few landowners the ability to subdivide their property and increase the housing supply, create good jobs in our community, more housing for constituents? I mean, especially if, <laughs> if uh, as Henry said previously, the amount of land that's even available to develop in the area is so marginal to start with. I just don't know. I don't know how it could be that down in Summerland, if we had a, a five or a 10 acre parcel, we would subdivide it. No problem. And we share the exact same water source feels like you're using a really heavy hand on us. And I know that there are, are more people that are not able to attend this meeting today that feel that same way. And I know that another one of the proposals, the proposed options that you had for the board was to um, cease and assist on the project. And I, I, I have a feeling that that's probably going to be the direction that the constituents want to head in on this one. Um, can you speak to, to, to why it could be that Summerland would be able to enjoy basic uses like agriculture? secondary suites, accessory dwellings, when we wouldn't be able to, when we share the exact same water supply, how could that be? Summerland has their own uh, license that they have been given by the Ministry of Forests. So that is one thing. I do see Shelly on the line and she's raised her hand, so she might be able to speak to this actually. So I'll just go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead. Hi there, you can hear me? Yep. Um, so I guess the clarification or the additional information that's required for this question is that uh, the folder water system infrastructure um, is at capacity currently. So we cannot um, increase our water license because we um, because the aquifer is already fully subscribed, which means that there's enough licenses on the system that they don't feel it's confident enough to issue further uh, licensing. Um, and secondly, the system. The infrastructure that we have existing in Folder is uh, is starting to age, um, and upgrades and replacement of of infrastructure to add additional um, connections onto that water system would be extremely expensive, um, and that's something that we're trying to avoid for the users of the system. So, Shelley, what what yes. about what about allocations uh, for like groundwater? Uh, wells that aren't reliant on the Folder community water system. I mean, the number one allocation of water in the province is residential use. 
And so right. if, if we're saying on one hand, like there's not enough water in the area, but then the second breath we're saying, we have the second largest supply of water in the Okanagan and we've got like thousand story uh, towers being proposed downtown Kelowna, yet we can't put in a single family residence. Or in we don't, we're not connected to the same system as Kelowna though. But do you see what I'm saying? Like, it, it seems like we have like this amazing abundance of water. Like, why why are we not able to enjoy this beautiful resource that we have responsibly? I mean, I guess the other thing to think about is like, because we're on septic here, when we, when we put the water down the sink and we've used it for washing dishes or flushing toilets or whatever, 25% of it evaporates into the atmosphere and 75% of it goes back into the water table. So what water did we actually take out of the system is the second question. Can you speak to that? I think you're um, maybe not getting a full picture of how the water is allocated and we can't um, use right to the absolute maximum limit of our system. Um, there has to be that safety there for, for years of drought and for years of high usage. Um, we're not responsible for agricultural water, so that is not something that we can control. Um, so that volume has to be there for use otherwise so we can't use up everything on residential use we're not allowed to do that so but i guess what i'm saying is is that for people who are outside the fault or water service i i'm i'm, I'm speaking to this from two different perspectives i'm i'm both inside the fault mm -hmm. or water service on one of my parcels and then the other parcel that i'm in the process of trying to subdivide and rezone is outside of the service Right. And I've got independent hydrogeologists saying that there's enough water there without causing any problems to any, any other existing infrastructure or so on. I think the, the struggle for us is that it may be fine looking at it from an individual perspective um, for your hydrogeologist to say you're not going to use that much water, that it's not a problem. But when we look at the system as a whole and the aquifer as a whole, if everybody starts saying, I just want a little bit, I just need a little bit of water. Um, that adds up and what we end up with is uh, dry wells coming down uh, Fish Lake Road from the top end at the cattle guard and it moves down the system. The, the shape of the aquifer doesn't, um, is is not kind and we don't have enough water to to make it through the summer some years. So, I mean, it, there's a history of, of limitations on that system for supply. On, on what system, the Falder Water Service? Yes. So I, I'm not talking about the Falder Water Service. I, I'm, I'm talking about a parcel that's outside of the Falder Water Service. And some of the conversations that I've had with other landowners that are mm -hmm. up against the same thing is that they're nowhere near the Falder Water Service, and they're located in an area that has strong water signal. Yeah. And it, it just seems it seems very arbitrary that we're being held up from from subdividing our land when we have certified engineers and professionals in our province saying this is not a problem um what I, I guess if what i'm wondering is why is the rdos taking this so seriously when we know that there is a well-maintained body of water the second largest in our area that's right in our backyard what body of water is that sir the Tro creek uh the Tro creek um aquifer oh Okay, uh, we, so I guess that's another part of this. The Folder water system runs off a groundwater system, not off Trout Creek itself. That would be considered a surface water license. So we have a groundwater license for um, the Dark Creek and Meadow Valley Aquifer, which is fed by Dark Creek. Um, we don't draw surface water from Trout Creek. So my understanding of the system is that because of the location of our new well that was drilled in 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. it's located in a confined sand and gravel aquifer scenario that's 80, I think it's 88% fed by Trout Creek, recharged, and it's 12% fed by Dark. And this is, all, this is all in your report as well that you guys got from Associated Environmental. Mm -hmm. So... It, it, I mean, it seems to me that if we're in a confined, if we're in a confined aquifer that's fed by Trout Creek, which is the raceway for all of the water that Summerland enjoys and the second largest tributary of water in the Okanagan Basin, how could it possibly be that we would run out of water? Again, it goes back to the limitations on our infrastructure and the limitations on the licensing that we have to supply water to Falder. 
I, I understand that, but what if we're not in the Falder water service? It's all connected the whole that's why we're looking at it from a watershed perspective, because. Uh, I said earlier, if you have. Um, every property saying, I just want to add, I'm just going to add uh, an accessory dwelling. If every property were to do that. That would compound into an incredible volume of water. So, to be fair, and to be even across the board, we can look at it and say, we can't pick and choose 1 by 1 who gets to subdivide and who doesn't. We're saying everybody is following is is going to go by the same rules and we're going to protect the water supply and we're going to protect that system because we don't want to have to upgrade and increase capacity and build a new reservoir and all those things that go with a water system. Well, and then I'm just also going to pop in just really quick here. Like I do see that we're kind of trickling between kind of the general folder zoning review and an individual application that is currently being dealt with. And, you know, certainly respectful, respectful of the fact that, you know, you have concerns for your own application. If we're going to be speaking about individual applications, this should be discussed um, probably offline and not under the same forum as just the general zone review, just to ensure that we're, you know, capturing, you know, any questions that might be asked about the general zone review itself. Yeah, I guess the main thing is, is just, it, it seems as though that we're being asked to live as, uh, as second class citizens when compared to our con contemporaries in Summerland when we enjoy the exact same water. It just doesn't, it doesn't seem fair. That's all. And I can certainly appreciate the comments that you've made and, you know, you know, as you know, um, for formal consideration by the board, you should put this in writing as well. And I do recommend uh, that you do so. Um, but again, I do appreciate the comments that you brought forward. So thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Shanna. And so I do see a hand up again from uh, Henry Steps. Uh, Henry, I've gone ahead and unmuted you. Go ahead. Hi, this isn't Henry, it's his wife, Barb. In listening hey, Barb. to everyone tonight, um, just curious, whenever I hear we have to stop everyone because we wouldn't be able to allow everybody to have a carriage house or subdivide. I really don't think everybody wants to. And I think perhaps it would be more democratic of us to maybe look at individual applications and the logical, perhaps if it is reasonable and plausible that it could be subdivided, then that's something you go forward with. I just don't like these blanket rules. They are more out of fear than they are out of being progressive with our, our way of designing and building our future surroundings in our environment. And it's so wonderful out here. I'd love to share a few acres with, with somebody that's got a young family or an old family. But by, by saying no to everybody, we, I just think we're we're not allowing for enjoyment that could be really benefited by our friends in Summerland. Thanks, Barb. Um, and so I guess to be clear, um, you know, this these amendments wouldn't necessarily remove the ability to apply for anything if you know certain permitted uses were to get taken away. Certainly, you know, it does put into place uh, policies that would discourage things like construction. Uh, constructing accessory dwellings and whatnot and would discourage subdivision, um, but um, it doesn't necessarily inherently take away the right for someone to apply for that. Um, you know, I don't need to be rude, but the right to apply. I, I've played that game. I'm, I'm a little older than you, Shannon, and life doesn't pl play out like that. You can apply, but you know all well and good that it's not going to be accepted. And it, I it just, you got to give people hope that there's availability. You know, what I really would like is to have my property subdivided so that my family member could live in my major home and I could have a, a smaller home because I'm older and I'm increasing growth between my family. But because of our financial systems, they would have to have their own title on the property to get a loan, a bank loan. So. I, that's why I want to see more individual and you say, well, you doesn't stop you from applying doesn't stop. But then you kick that, but then the back door closes because there's no more water. I can hear it already. You know, sure. Go ahead. Take my money, 
but you're not going to give me my application. You're not going to to say it can go through. I just feel like that's so much of the game this, these days and not just with the government or our DOS or anyone else. It's just sure we can go ahead, but kind of the bodies that govern know it's not going to happen. Well, I think that's just not very straightforward. And I hope that we would look at things more individually. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. And I see Shelly's hand has popped up. Um, sorry, Shelly, I'll just make you a panelist to make it a bit easier here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to clarify, I guess, the blanket statement about um, making sure that nobody gets to subdivide versus uh, the individual um, approval process for, for those that are interested in the subdivision. I guess where we're looking at and the consequence of that is that the system with the limitations on the system and the fact that there is infrastructure that would need to be um, upgraded and expanded the cost of that is going to fall on the whole community. It's not just falling on you because you've subdivided your property. It falls into like falls under the responsibility of the whole community. So to have a blanket um, rule apply for no subdivision means that it is equitably um, applied to everyone and everyone gets or is is limited in what responsibility they hold with the upgrading of the system and the costs associated with it, if that makes it any clearer. Thanks, Shelley. Um, so I do see we're nearing eight o'clock now. Um, I'm happy to take, you know, some um, just quick questions um, as we're starting to wrap up here. Um, I do see John has his hand up, so I'll go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah. It Barb brought up a really interesting point. It, you take a look at anywhere else in the world, and typically the elders are integrated into the family. They help raise the children while the middle generation uh, makes all the money and keeps the machine moving. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that was really attractive to us about buying this property back in 2019 is that my, my wife's mom is aging. She wants to sell a house and um, having the ability to put a carriage house on our property in order to sort of su sustain a more comfortable way of life for her and for our family was very attractive. And to what Barb was saying, um, I, I don't think that there's enough of that in our communities. And it's interesting that the provincial government is looking to, to to speak to this. Do you not feel that your policy and the way that you're trying to steer the design of this policy kind of flies in the face of those traditional family values where you could potentially have like multifamily scenarios, especially like out in <laughs> out in nature where it's really beautiful and there's lots of things to do and places to hike and things to see like why why are why are we trying to shut that down? Seems like a really beautiful thing to have in the community. And yeah, you know, as I mentioned, John, you know, you're welcome to put this in uh, a formal submission to the board as well. Um, but certainly, you know, we want to ensure through the use of zoning and through the use of policies that we do have water for communities as we go through the future to support families. Um, that currently live out there and may live out there in the future. So this is, in a, in a sense, an approach uh, to support those uh, those ideals as well. Um, and I do see, um, like as I mentioned, we're past eight at this point. Sandy did have his hand up uh, just right before, um, and I'll just allow this one more comment uh, before we start to wrap things up. But um, as I mentioned, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to get their comments heard, um, or if you have additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And as I mentioned, um, you're welcome to put your comments in a written submission as well to the board before first and second reading. So, Sandy, go ahead. Yes, thanks, Sean. Uh, I, you know, I, I hear what John is saying about sustainable communities and stuff like that. But the key to a sustainable community in a rural area is having a reliable water source. 
and John didn't live out here back in the 90s, I don't believe, uh, when I did see my neighbors actually hauling water for two or three years because the aquifer didn't sustain the development that was in the area. Uh, if and, and the problem is really is that there is no long term reliable data on the dynamics of the Falder or the Meadow Valley aquifer and all of this study is pointing us in the right direction, but you're going to make long term development decisions and find out again that there isn't enough water. What are you going to do? Take surface water from Trout Creek? That's an option always, but it's very expensive. And, and, um, uh, and, and as far as. You know, looking at each individual application and not having this omnibus blanket zoning uh, or bylaw situation. The thing is, is that if John gets it or I gets it, uh, get a, get a, 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 a make an application and it's successful. It's I don't care what anyone says. That's viewed as a precedent and is used in that in that regard for future applications. So it's really easy to oversubscribe the resource unless you know what the resource, um, what the capacity of the resource is. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And so I know that we've gotten some comments as well in the chat here. I will be going through the transcript. If there's any questions that we're able to follow up on, um, you know, I believe for the most part, I have had email exchanges with uh, most every attendee here. Uh, so I'm happy to reach out to you um, and also speak, you know, with the utility staff as well, you know, for anything that I'm not able to answer from a planning perspective. Um, but certainly, you know, I'm very appreciative of the comments and the questions that we've received today. Um, and aside from that, um, I might, I'll just have to uh, close the meeting for the night, but thank you everyone for coming. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, Shannon and Shelley and Colin for spending your evening with us. It was much appreciated. And thank you for everybody for attending too. great comments. All right, well, thank you everyone and have a great night.